Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. The webinar is titled California's Electric Vehicle Incentives, What Do We Know? This webinar is part of the Greenlight webinar series hosted by the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California, Davis. If you want to learn more about the Greenlight webinar series, watch previous webinars, or find upcoming webinars, please visit our website at its.ucdavis.edu. Following the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where we will pull questions asked by the audience. To ask the question, please use the Q&A button located on the bottom of the screen. The webinar and presentation slides will also be available after the webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Austin Brown. Great, thanks Leon, and um, a big thanks to everyone for, for joining me. Um, I think the nitty gritty of EV policy and the related research is one of the most interesting topics in the world, but sometimes it doesn't feel like everyone agrees. So it was great to see the level of interest and enthusiasm for this topic. Um, and I will try to, uh, try to help share a lot of information um, in a, a short period of time. Um, and then of course we're, we're available uh, going forward to answer any additional questions that we don't get to um, in this discussion. Um, so my name is Austin Brown. I direct uh, our Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy at UC Davis. Uh, the Institute works with the Institute of Transportation Studies and other groups around UC Davis, as well as the broader research community, to try to help make um, the deep expertise and research that's available uh, more accessible and useful for policymakers um, that need to make tough decisions about uh, how to set real world policy for uh, the future of our environment and energy and transportation systems. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about some work that we've been doing, uh, reviewing what is known in the literature about the suite of policies that we have to try to promote the deployment of electric vehicles um, through policies like EV incentives. Um, I will say at the beginning, uh, for anybody who's never given a webinar, it's profoundly weird to talk into a phone in a room where there's just two of us, just Leon and me is sitting here, uh, and remember that I'm actually trying to speak to and keep the attention of a, a big group of experts. So I'm gonna do my best to keep my energy up um, yeah, forgive me if I, if, I, if I get a little off topic. That, that's uh, for those of you who know me personally, that's a little bit my MO, um, but I'll try to at least get through the content. And um, this is also much more text heavy than a typical uh, presentation I would give. Um, that's largely because we have a huge amount of research being reviewed here, and uh, we don't really have a better way to summarize the findings than just um, stating what we were trying to do and what we were trying to learn. So um, my apologies in advance for the text heavy nature of the discussion. Um, this is, I think, a wonkier topic than maybe we have typically typically in some of these webinars, um, but based on the RSVP list that I saw, we have a lot of real experts on the phone, and so I think folks will appreciate being able to get deep into these topics um, and, and discuss our findings. As Leon mentioned, we really want to do, do want to make sure we address any questions. You can add them in any time, so don't feel like you have to wait to the end to submit a question. You can put it in and it will be kept in the, the question and answer tray for us uh, until we get to the, um, the Q&A section um, at the end. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, so, uh, so first I wanna start with a few acknowledgements. Um, so first of all, this is a summary, as I mentioned, of research in progress. Uh, so it may be updated as the papers are finalized. We wanted to um, get the uh, findings out there as quickly as possible. So are presenting this before the publication date of the underlying research. Um, I really want to acknowledge uh, support from the California Air Resources Board uh, and the Center for Sustainable Energy as well for project support review and, and really um, extensive expert input. It's, uh, it's always gratifying to work on a project that has um, such strong engagement from, uh, from the sponsors and from the, the experts that we hope will be able to use these, uh, these findings. And we also include here uh, towards the end in this webinar some findings from a study that was supported by um, Senate Bill 1. Uh, and, and are very grateful for that support as well. Um, and then uh, we will be publishing these results as a series of white papers. We're not sure of the publication timing at this time. It just depends on how quickly we're able to finalize uh, finalize the results. But as Leon mentioned, the, so this webinar itself will be available shortly after the, the conclusion of the webinar. Um, and we're very happy to answer questions about the findings um, in advance of the final publications. There we go. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the motivation for the study. So it is in California and the broader uh, energy communities compelling interest to examine subsidies and other policies to encourage deployment of electric vehicles for a variety of reasons that I won't go into here. Um, but I want to use this chart to kind of document what we think of as the integrating need for um, public policy in 
uh, getting to large-scale deployment of EVs. So this is kind of a, a super chart looking at the top at a few kinds of incentives that are, are available, um, and then uh, what we sort of expect to be the generalized, maybe cartoonified transition as you get through first-generation innovators, which we've already seen as early adopters for electric vehicles, into the innovators and followers, uh, which you could argue where we are now, and then getting into the third generation of these vehicles um, where you have uh, both second purchases of EVs from the initial purchasers, as well as entry more into the mass market. And one of the themes that we'll see a couple of times in our findings um, is that we have to be hyper aware that the uh, what we know about incentives and their effectiveness will actually probably change as we go to a different makeup of purchasers and adopters of these electric vehicles. But we really want to be thinking about this as a suite of policies that can potentially help support a transition from a status quo uh, transportation system to one that uh, includes many more uh, plug-in electric vehicles that, that reduce uh, energy dependence and, and emissions. Um, so the motivation of this study is to look at uh, what we know about the current suite of policies, really with a focus on California, but leveraging what we know from other markets and helping understand what that might mean for the coming years of deployment policies and many of the um, policy decisions that will need to be made by California state government and others. So the, a tiny bit of overview on the, Cal the California Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, which is at the heart of many of these research questions. Um, this is definitely not intended to be a overall briefing on the uh, on the uh, CVRP. Uh, this is just supposed to be a refresher. There's much more information on the CVRP itself on both the California Air Resources Board website and the Center for Sustainable Energy. Um, but as a sort of a refresher, it was created originally in 2007 um, as a first come first served incentive for, uh, for people to purchase uh, electric vehicles in California. Uh, at the beginning, there was no means testing, meaning no income caps, and the same rebate was provided for all um, income levels. Since then, we've seen several uh, policy changes um, that are the focus of the research that I'm going to discuss today um, that changed the CVRP to attempt to increase the reach of this uh, incentive program uh, to more low-income consumers. Um, and specifically in 2016, the Air Resources Board implemented an income cap, um, increased rebates for low and moderate income consumers, and increase their outreach efforts to increase the awareness of the availability of these incentives, as well as awareness of the availability um, and benefits of electric vehicles overall. Um, and those are the, the, the policy changes that uh, our research has attempted to um, estimate the implications um, of based on the research that's available uh, in the literature. Um, so those will be discussed here today. So we have a series of white papers on each aspect of those changes, a white paper on um, the effect of introducing an income cap, uh, a white paper on the uh, effect of increased rebates, um, and a white paper on what we might know about the impact of increased outreach programs. Um, and then as a bonus, uh, we've in I've included some findings from a related white paper, uh, if we have time as we get to it. Uh, looking at the qu how you can quantify emissions reduction. So really just asking the question that seems simple but actually turns out to be quite nuanced of um, do electric vehicles reduce emissions and, and how much. Um, that turns out to depend on a number of, of research factors. Um, so I'll jump in. We're gonna, I'm going to go through the findings for each of these in order. I'll talk about some of the top level findings um, and what we believe the policy implications of each of these research areas um, are. Uh, at the very end, I have a few slides of just some of the selected bibliographic references that we included in this. Um, all of these research efforts were simply summaries of the existing research base. They were not uh, attempts to uh, add new peer-reviewed uh, research to the literature, um, but we do include in each study an evaluation of some of the potential uh, research questions that, that are still out there and still open and could be addressed further uh, as we go through um, the process of de deploying electric vehicles and testing out this, these policy sets. Um, so the project goals that we undertook to influence the development of, of review for each of these papers, uh, our goal was to synthesize the best published uh, and ongoing research available, highlight the important gaps that I mentioned, and we want to provide some sort of a framework for understanding these dimensions. Uh, and then maybe most challenging is to both make a clear link between those research findings and the policy implications, but also to try to be accessible to any interested but non-technical audience. So try to be clear enough that um, that folks who are not uh, way steep in the uh, nuances of EV policy can uh, can can help um, understand what these policies mean and what the real world decisions that are being made are. Of course, trying to make it uh, you know both a clear link as well as totally accessible is always the challenge that, that we face. Um, but but we we have done uh, our best in that regard. 
Okay, so let's jump into, uh, into our findings. Um, I'll start with the impact of the CVRP income cap. So as I mentioned, this paper reviews and summarizes basically everything that we know about this income cap as a change, that is what it would be expected to do in terms of effects on the EV market um, and the uh, makeup of uh, those who take advantage of the rebate um, and sales overall. Um, as we found throughout uh, all three of these projects, uh, because of the recent nature of these programs, there are not yet that we're aware of peer-reviewed research that's published a, a, attributing impacts to the specific effects of changing the CVRP. So we don't have a peer-reviewed paper out there that can go and make a causal, a direct causal finding in terms of, for example, the effect on sales of the CVRP. Um, you know, good news, we're not stopping there, so we, we're not just uh, abandoning hope because that specific study hasn't yet been done, and we do expect that that sort of research will be uh, developed um, now that the changes have been in effect for a couple of years. Um, we do also, though, uh, note that there's a, not, a lot of analogous research out there that we can use to uh, come up with sort of a, a best estimate of what the effect might be, as well as just direct observation, thanks to the reporting done by the Center for Sustainable Energy. And when we, when we combine what we know from the literature on income caps and related policies in general with the specifics, we're able to, I think, actually identify some pretty important findings. Um, but but the so the specific numbers are here for for your reference. Um, income cap change, uh, changes made in 2016, uh, eventually reducing the income caps at the bottom there for participants to $150,000 a year for single, uh, up to uh, 300,000 uh, for joint filers. Um, so the idea is, if you are over that income level, you are more than welcome to purchase an electric vehicle, but no longer will be able to receive the California uh, CVRP uh, rebate program rebate. Um, so the key findings, um, some of these that I've got here, the key papers that reference the bibliography that would be great places to look. There are many more than this that were referenced for these, but these are the, I think, top places to look for each of these findings. Um, so the first one, uh, which probably won't surprise people who've been in this field for a little while, uh, we do see that so far, new buyers of zero emission vehicles, or ZEVs, tend to be higher income than average buyers of new cars. And I'll add as a sort of a, an aside, uh, people who buy new cars al already tend to be higher income um, than people on average. We see this from some of our other research that mostly um, buyers of new cars tend to be higher income um, than the average person uh, and even the average car buyer, and that, that uh, lower income households tend to buy more, more used vehicles. Um, however, we are seeing in, in the still in the top key finding that this is shifting over time um, and it's likely, I think we can attribute it as likely to because of changes in policies such as these income caps. So we're seeing that the demographics, and I'll show you some data on this a little bit later, the demographics of, uh, of ZEV buyers are now becoming more similar to those of buyers of new cars overall. Um, the second finding is looking at past uh, studies of where these subsidies went and those studies have found uh, that past subsidies for both hybrid electric vehicles, which we use as an analogy, and plug-in zero emission vehicles have predominantly gone to higher income buyers and maybe even uh, at least as worrying if you're interested in increasing the effect of, uh, of incentives on total deployment, uh, many buyers who would have purchased electric vehicles without the rebate anyway. So this is worrying from a policy perspective because if the idea of a uh, incentive is to increase deployment. If it would not have changed somebody's decision in some point, in some sense, it's it's not useful as a as a policy. It's just um, money that's being spent on a, on an on a rebate that wouldn't change somebody's mind. So part of the uh, idea, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end of a of a strong CVRP or, or incentive policy in general, is to try your best to direct incentives to the people who are most in need of them to uh, make that purchase decision. Um, and then related to that, the purchase decisions of those higher income car buyers are, are much less sensitive to ZEV rebates. Um, that is, people who are buying, who are higher income, uh, have less of a, uh, less of a um, decision factor around the availability of a rebate in determining whether or not to purchase that vehicle. Um, a few more key findings on the next slide. Uh, we, we do see now, as I mentioned earlier, that recipients are becoming more similar now to new car buyers overall, and that's according, as I mentioned, to rebate program data. Um, so we can't make a conclusive causal, causal uh, link because of the lack of direct peer-reviewed studies, um, but the correlation in the data is, is high and I think fairly obvious, and I'll show you some of those from the Center for Sustainable Energy later. And a highlight from that is that the share of rebate recipients 
uh, in the data uh, for, that we're earning more than $300,000 annually, which is you know, very high household income, uh, has dropped from 16% of buyers to 2%, and that we think has got to be a, a reporting error because they're uh, not, not, as we said, no longer eligible to receive that rebate. So the survey is it's self-reported, and people may report their income differently than what's used in, uh, in the actual policy decision-making. So we've really seen the share fall from a pretty significant portion uh, overrepresented in, you know, 16% more than the percentage of households that make more than $300,000 annually, and that's dropped off. And we see at the same time the share of rebate recipients with lower than $50,000 of annual income um, nearly doubled from 5% to about 10%. Again, I'll show that in a graph in a, in a moment. Um, one factor that surprised researchers, but I think is really important context here, um, we might expect that as these vehicles became more mass market, the importance of a rebate or how important a rebate is to an individual's decision to purchase would go down as the vehicle costs drop, which we've seen, and as more um, more infrastructure is available and as more people are aware of EVs. We have not actually seen that happen yet. And in fact, looking at reported rebate essentiality, that is the, the percentage of people that say they would not have purchased a vehicle without the availability of the incentive, that essentiality has actually increased. Um, uh, as more price sensitive buyers have entered the market. So as we get out of these early adopters, we're now seeing that people care more, not less about these rebates. And I think that really emphasizes the importance of having a rebate program that is overall uh, directed to um, help benefit those who are most sensitive or at least more sensitive to the availability of that, um, of that rebate. Um, here's the graph I mentioned just to kind of emphasize some of that. So you can see around when the program uh, caps went into effect, um, the share that were uh, in those higher income categories have dropped quite significantly, while that uh, share that was to the lowest uh, income um, uh, quintile uh, went up quite uh, significantly and actually has now made up, started to make up a pretty significant um, share of the uh, overall um, rebates. And I should also mention this is in the context of an increasing volume um, in overall rebates. That is, during this time, there, the amount of total rebates that have been given um, has been going up as more electric vehicles have been sold in California. Um, and that, that's shown here in this uh, rebate total. You can see the, uh, the total incentives that have gone up between the 2016 and 2018 um, timeframe and overlaid with that the, when the income criteria went into effect and when it was modified. So we at least haven't seen, uh, so I should emphasize the research doesn't let us say uh, that the changes didn't affect the total volume of vehicles. That would require a, a sort of direct study to attribute um, and really understanding the counterfactual of how many vehicles might have been sold in the absence of those changes. And that, as I said, was not available. Um, but we at least see that based on the data, um, the change appears to be having the uh, desired effect and it hasn't dampened the uh, overall demand uh, for those electric vehicles um, writ large so far. Um, in terms of key research gaps, understanding income, so several of these have come up already. Uh, we really want to understand, uh, the, better understand the effect of total market, uh, the total market effects of these caps. So what ha change has that had on uh, people's purchase overall of electric vehicles? Um, you would expect that no matter what, if you reduce the eligibility, you are going to lose some sales. There will still be some people who are um, choosing not to make that purchase because they no longer have the ability to get that rebate. Um, and then uh, we'd especially be interested in studying how this, has how this will change over time as we introduce more new electric models into the fleet. During that same time, we've seen many more electric vehicle models become available and understanding that uh, that interaction is a key research gap. And, and then tying that all together, uh, we, I think there's an important need for explicit analysis of the effect of the income cap uh, with, with that could make a causal in inference and say the cap had this effect um, on the total purchases and the overall deployment of electric vehicles. Um, in terms of policy implications, so because of this, because of the observation that's quite robust in the literature that higher income buyers are less sensitive to a rebate, uh, we, an income cap is expected to reduce what we call, might call free ridership or the number of people purchasing the vehicle that would have anyway, um, while, while not necessarily reducing those sales as significantly. Um, we've seen that sales have continued to grow by uh, income caps going into effect. Um, and then maybe very importantly, uh, because this importance has increased over time, uh, making sure that there's availability of incentives and rebates uh, will be an important determination of, of, of EV adoption rates in the near future um, as the cost of electric vehicles uh, continue to come down. Um, the second paper I'll go over, which is a very related and was actually very hard to disentangle in the research process, 
uh, is the effect of the CVRP increased rebate program, where uh, the uh, the amount of a rebate a household receives is actually higher for low in, lower income consumers. Um, and similarly, we found that uh, because of the, the similar recentness of those changes, which are on the same time frame um, in 2016, uh, there's also no peer-reviewed studies of this effect. Um, but we do, again, identify a number of studies that identify the price sensitivity of lower income consumers and actually can make some pretty strong um, arguments about the uh, effect of these policies. I'll get into that in a moment. Um, the specifics of the policy change are the bottom two bullets there, uh, showing the uh, increased rebate eventually uh, to make it a total of $2,000 increased rebate um, for lower income consumers, uh, here defined as less than 300% of the um, federal poverty line. Uh, so the key findings from this paper, uh, so it may be not surprising, but well documented in an excellent uh, paper by uh, Mulliger and Rapson of, of UC Davis, uh, they, they found convincingly that price is an important determinant of uh, EV demand. Um, they found that a 10% decrease in the price of the EV leads to a 39% increase in the quantity of the EVs purchased among that subpopulation. So that's a very robust effect um, in terms of a change in price leading to um, the potential increases in uh, in, in adoption. Um, we also saw from survey data from the Center for Sustainable Energy uh, from Williams 2018 that uh, those who purchase uh, vehicles with a lower MSRP and lower income individuals, so those who buy lower cost vehicles as well as lower income, uh, in general state that rebates are more important, um, implying that it's uh, potentially effective to, to devote more of the uh, incentives to those lower income buyers. Um, and then uh, from DeShazo 2017, uh, they, he found that uh, steep rebates based on income uh, may induce larger increases overall in demand than the status quo, so that a uh, basically justifying the original deployment of this income cap um, and uh, and uh, higher income higher rebate for lower income um, buyers. Uh, and then again from Williams 2018, these recent changes uh, have correlated with an increase in the share of rebates being received by those lower income households. And I think I have another copy of the graph to, to remind anyone, but we do see that in the data based on the rebates. Um, based on the rebates going forward in the bottom right, we can see a significant increase in those income levels that would be um, more likely to be able to benefit from that, that increased rebate program. Um, so a few key gaps in the literature, uh, again, uh, lack of explicit analysis of that cause and effect, um, and similarly, in, in lack of analysis of how this changes with uh, upcoming models that may have, uh, in many cases, lower MSRP, um, really understanding this next sort of wave of buyers with vehicles that have more form factors and a wider variety of price points. Um, and then uh, really a need to use better uh, econometric methods um, to understand this causal effect of these programs. And that's, that's a, a theme that we saw um, throughout the research. Um, and then there's, I think, a need to analyze the potential, a question of uh, if more segmentation based on income might be more effective. So right now there's basically two income levels. You're either, I guess, three. You're either low income, in which case you receive an increased rebate, uh, you're in the middle, in which case you get the regular rebate, or above the cap, in which case you cannot receive the, the rebate. Um, theoretically, there could be more gradations or more changes, um, and I don't believe we yet have strong analysis of really trying to help determine what a maybe an optimized or a, a uh, strongest approach to segmentation might be. Um, we just do see that, uh, based on the literature, the segmentation that's currently there does appear to be having many of the desired effects um, so far in the marketplace. In terms of um, policy implications, uh, so we have seen some uh, researchers arguing for incentives to target specific purchaser types. Um, so we see that right now uh, electric vehicles are, are in a particular segment of the market, largely smaller vehicles and sedans, um, and, and not necessarily purchased um, universally by the, same, by the uh, whole car buying public. Um, so you could potentially target incentives to specific purchaser types. Um, uh, we, we do find the, well, there's a strong implication that uh, incentives may have a higher social benefit uh, for a given cost, as if we had a specific amount of money to invest in the CVRP program or other sorts of um, uh, rebate programs, uh, incentives to those uh, lower income groups may have a higher uh, social benefit. Um, and then we do uh, look at the potential for a more progressive rebate with more brackets that might be more effective in increasing EV adoption. Of course, that comes with potential trade-offs 
in terms of program design and the complexity of design, which, which gets a little bit into the, the outreach questions and, and whether people understand about the availability of these rebates. Um, so there's a, a, always a policy uh, balance needed to understand um, the, the trade-offs in those sorts of areas. Uh, and then maybe, maybe this comes as a no-brainer, but I think the literature uh, strongly supports it, uh, that the availability of rebates is an important determination of future ZEV adoption, that this is still a market where people are uh, making very price-sensitive decisions, and there's still you know, a relatively small portion of, of overall sales in the new vehicle market, um, and we see that the uh, increased statement of importance um, it means that as we get into that mass market, uh, with these uh, rebates and, and other sorts of policies will be very important determinants. Um, the, the last paper uh, that we reviewed looks at uh, impacts of increased outreach uh, as a part of the overall CVRP program. So this builds on findings that awareness of electric vehicles uh, in California is actually uh, surprisingly low and that even within people who are aware of, of EVs, uh, far from everyone is aware of the availability of CVRP as a rebate source. Um, so this paper reviews and summarizes what we understand about the potential um, impact of increasing the amount of CVRP program um, work that goes to um, outreach and educational work. Um, so once again, I'm sorry if everybody's tired of hearing this, but uh, because of the recency of the program, uh, there still are not uh, peer-reviewed uh, evaluations or research on the specific effects of the CVRP in terms of the effect on overall um, purchases. Uh, it's also, I think, this one is going to be very complex ever to tease out because uh, people hear about topics like electric vehicles from many different sources, and so attributing any change to a specific program is very challenging. Um, but as, I as I'll talk about a little bit later, there's robust research um, showing us that the, uh, out that the awareness and attitudes towards EVs are a major uh, policy challenge to large-scale deployment and need to be included. So. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the findings there. Uh, so the, the increased rebate was uh, is, sh is shown here with, with the Center for Sustainable Energy did uh, hire additional staff and do more outreach. Um, they increased their direct interactions uh, by, by um, several factors uh, between um, yeah, as they went forward. Uh, and then in 2018, the DMV uh, used mailers to inform uh, 700,000 individuals of CVRP. Um, as a, a direct um, outreach campaign. So these are the sorts of programs that, uh, that the CVRP uh, program staff are, are working on um, and would seek to understand the literature on, um, on available uh, data for what the impact of that outreach might be um, better. Uh, so in terms of key findings, um, one that still shocks me, even though I've now known about this for several years, it still shocks me every time I look at the data, uh, is that awareness of electric vehicles is low, uh, even in California. So I'm guessing that everybody who's on this call has known about electric vehicles as a, as a technology, um, but it's not high. Most people in California cannot name a single electric vehicle. Um, and then maybe more worrying, uh, awareness from those uh, survey studies uh, in California has not increased between 2014 and 2017. So uh, we have not yet seen wide-scale awareness of the existence of electric vehicles. Um, so that implies that uh, outreach investment probably needs to grow, uh, and there, one factor behind that is uh, any outreach program that is done at the state level is likely to be much, much smaller than general vehicle advertising expenditures, where uh, auto companies um, spend a lot of money advertising vehicles, uh, and not a lot of that goes to discuss electric vehicles. So um, awareness campaigns will always sort of have that level of uh, other vehicles that people are hearing about. Um, we also found uh, several papers in the literature that look at dealer awareness, since dealers are a major place that people look about, look to learn about vehicles that they might purchase, um, and found that dealers have very low levels of knowledge and interest in selling EVs in most of these um, studies that have been done. Um, I will say there are now um, several uh, dealer and automaker-led efforts to try to improve this, um, but the studies that have been done have so far revealed that um, most dealers uh, do not yet have a, a, a lot of um, expertise or interest in um, selling those vehicles. Uh, so, you know, just as kind of a finding, they could potentially have a strong impact in um, increasing awareness and potentially sales of EVs, but, but so far ha has not been the case. Um, continuing the findings, uh, we do find that usage of EVs, it, it, for example, in test drives, uh, tend to increase positive impressions. Um, that is, most people who 
uh, try an EV, uh, increase their opinion of electric vehicles. So they now uh, like them more. Uh, and in some studies, but not, not all, it increases stated purchase intentions. So after test driving an EV, people will, uh, will state they're more likely to buy it. Um, however, there was another study um, that uh, goes the other direction and found a decrease in purchase intentions. So, you know, as with all topics where there's still fairly early in the, the, the literature, there's not going to be widespread agreement um, in terms of exactly what the effects are. Uh, we do find in terms of uh, evaluating what people think about electric vehicles and what their detractors might be as uh, a so-called range anxiety or the, uh, the uh, worry that electric vehicle charging might not be available or that the range of the vehicle would be insufficient um, is still a significant detractor. Um, and one factor with that is that it was identified in a study that found that um, that individuals significantly overestimate their actual range needs. So if you ask them how far they would need a vehicle to go, they come up with a number that's actually much further than what they would need based on their real world driving habits. Um, but that's just, you know, understanding the human nature aspects of their opinions and, and attitudes towards these vehicles and trying to um, learn from them. Uh, the studies that we reviewed also found that the so-called green characteristics or environmental performance of these electric vehicles um, are only important to a small segment of consumers. Um, and there's general uncertainty about electric vehicles among those who are aware um, in terms of, you know, are they a, a technology that's here to stay? What are their net impacts? Um, and those sorts of uncertainties that, that deter potential buyers um, from, uh, from buying them. Uh, and then some studies found that providing uh, information on full cost of ownership, uh, so that is saying what would you be spending on a vehicle in terms of the purchase price and the fuel costs, um, comparing electric vehicles to uh, internal combustion engine vehicles or ICEVs uh, is the most effective in increasing adoption in, in, in at least one study. Um, research gaps, I think there, there are many here. I would, I would argue that this is uh, highly understudied since uh, awareness and um, attitudes towards EVs will be uh, fundamental to their eventual adoption. Um, we see a big gap in scientific evaluation of past and ongoing outreach investments. So what I mean by that is there are significant efforts now um, by nonprofit ZEV promoters, by um, states and countries uh, in terms of making people aware. Uh, those don't come with uh, linked scientific evaluations, uh, testing the effectiveness, what works, and do they actually increase um, uh, interest in sales of these vehicles. Um, so coupling evaluation with those sorts of outreach efforts I think will be essential. Um, we need more research on best practices in order to inform dealers. So I'm gratified to see some automakers starting to work with their uh, groups of dealers in terms of helping them understand the EV offerings and, and how to make buyers aware of those. Um, but we haven't yet seen much research on what those best practices are overall and how that could work better. Um, a lot of study on how best to ameliorate or address uh, con uh, con people, the concerns that people have with electric vehicles. So I mentioned range. Uh, we talked about high purchase costs and how those can be addressed. Um, and then uh, there's a need for more uh, direct cost effectiveness evaluation of these ongoing investments that California is making in outreach. Um, so there's some data collected from that DMV campaign that the Center for Sustainable Energy has, has analyzed and that can serve as an important baseline for understanding how these outreach campaigns work and um, how to potentially uh, make sure they're improved going forward. Um, policy implications uh, for, for this, uh, so I, I mentioned this, but the low awareness and is a really a key barrier to EV deployment. Um, I think this increases the importance of outreach as a component. It's been challenging in the past because it's very difficult to understand how to plan, manage, and evaluate an outreach uh, campaign. Um, but the data really shows that these factors, awareness and attitudes, are key gaps, and so we have to make sure that we um, include uh, campaigns that can help at least, at the very least, um, support uh, individuals with complete information in order to help them make uh, good purchase decisions and consider electric vehicles as a possible option. Um, we do see that there's some evidence that focusing on cost savings um, uh, may, may help spur purchases for those who are already aware of EVs, uh, and then because we really know very little about the uh, effectiveness of specific approaches, you know, beyond some of the top level findings that I reported here. Uh, we really want to encourage um, anybody on this webinar or anybody you work with that's considering an outreach or evaluation, an outreach or um, awareness campaign uh, to include uh, strong program evaluation um, in those outreach efforts so that we can help build a research base to help understand what those, um, what those uh, actions could look like.
Um, so the last paper, which which was done for an, uh, a project under Senate Bill One, the um, uh, which uh, funded significant research uh, at the University of California, um, is looking at the quantification of emissions reductions. Um, from electric vehicles. Uh, so basically trying to answer the question of, uh, you know, do EVs reduce emissions and, and how much? Um, so <clears throat> I, we can divide these studies identified here um, uh, into uh, two categories. So some that look economy-wide to try to assess uh, changes in emissions based on the change of the stock in the vehicle and looking across all relevant sectors. Um, so basically comparing two, uh, two states of the world, one that has EVs and one that does not, and seeing what the total emissions are differences there. And another <clears throat> broad category that's much more common um, called life cycle assessments, which look at the supply chain approach. So basically trying to uh, determine um, how many emissions are attributed to a vehicle, not just as it operates, where of course uh, electric vehicles um, have essentially zero uh, uh, emissions, um, to, but also to include the manufacturer, the electric um, demand for vehicles, and in some cases, the uh, disposal and end of life of those vehicles. Um, so that's the second class of analyses, and both both tell us different things about the overall um, emissions profiles of electric vehicles. Um, so, so here, maybe maybe I wanted to talk about this in addition because here we actually have some very uh, strong and conclusive uh, uh, findings. <clears throat> so, do EVs re reduce GHG emissions? Um, they well addressed, and yes, the findings are yes, they do. Um, I can really simplify to that. There are dozens of studies that that do this um, and and find it. Uh, but, you know, there's always a but, uh, different energy mixes and uh, policies, choices of vehicles, charging approaches um, can uh, moderate or increase these uh, benefits significantly. So, yes, they do reduce the uh, GHG emissions, but how much uh, defend, depends very strongly on the specifics of the vehicle, how it's used, especially how it's charged, um, and the future of uh, questions like, like recycling and reuse of, of batteries. Um, so those are important questions, but shouldn't distract from the central finding that, uh, that, that yes, uh, electric vehicles do tend to um, reduce uh, electric, do, do tend to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so there's many more nuances uh, in terms of uh, papers and how they define um, scopes uh, that, that are included here. Um, I, I, th I think I'll just focus on this since I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions. Um, I'll just focus on a few of the gaps. So there's a, not a lot of consideration of vehicle lifetime and battery replacement assumptions. So how long the battery lasts and how long those vehicles last and how long how that might influence emissions um, as well as, uh, you know, taking a broad scope and really understanding the uh, full um, policy landscape into which those vehicles enter. Um, a few other questions that we addressed, uh, how do common driving patterns and conditions affect electric vehicle emissions? So weather receives a lot of attention. Uh, we, we find here uh, that there is strong evidence that vehicle usage, so how people drive, and weather conditions can have very significant um, impacts on uh, both battery capacity and lifespan, as well as therefore on, um, on emissions. Um, so these are important factors for uh, for those thinking about modeling EVs, as well as policymakers and, um, to take into account. Uh, and um, then looking at uh, how uh, EV es emissions estimates change uh, with different uh, electricity emission intensities. So this is basically a question of, we know electric vehicles use electricity. How do you attribute the electricity produced to a given electric vehicle? Um, and there's a few different methods. So we looked at uh, trying to make an attributional versus a consequential. So the former basically you say uh, what, what is used and we'll attribute that to an EV, whereas a consequential says because of this EV, what electricity mix was added. Um, and so this relates also to this concept of average emissions versus marginal or the amount, the, the electricity that was generated because of that additional EV. Um, so there's no definitive consensus in the literature, but using these uh, marginal consequential approaches um, seem to be a more robust way to estimate the real world effects of electric vehicles. So that would say, um, where possible, it's good to take an approach of understanding what actually, uh, what electricity generation is, uh, is added because of the addition of an EV or multiple EVs into the system in which they enter. And that also makes you then think about the importance of topics like adding in um, real-time pricing information or real-time emissions information and other sorts of um, ways to try to uh, shift EV charging to uh, less environmentally impactful uh, emission sources. Um, so this is overall interpretation, not just for this, the last paper, but really overall. 
Um, now I'll kind of take off the research findings hat and put the uh, Austin Brown's personal interpretation hat. Um, so this is just what I take away from what I know is a, a lot of kind of eye bleeding uh, level of detail research. Um, so let's we'll start with what do we want to accomplish? So two stated goals that we have for EV policy are cost effectiveness. Um, so try to ensure that these rebates go to those who would not have otherwise purchased an EV and equity. And this is really hard to define completely. Um, so I'll just here call it a sense of fairness in the distribution of rebate recipient attributes. Um, so a goal of sort of evenly distributing these incentives um, across a range of demographics, especially income. So based on the studies that we have so far, the changes made appear likely to improve both of these metrics. Um, I don't think that means that we've got the policy exactly right for perpetuity, um, but it does appear to both increase the cost effectiveness by effectively uh, decreasing free ridership and increasing the uh, incentives that go to people who need them to purchase, make the purchase, um, and improves equity by sort of um, tilting the scales towards lower income purchasers of EVs. Um, I, I'll reemphasize the third bullet, which is just outreach. It's this huge component that's poorly understood in terms of the effectiveness. Um, we know it's important. We don't know how well these programs work. We don't know what the right approach is to engage on outreach overall. Um, and it's just a big um, gap in terms of our understanding of the effectiveness of a policy structure overall. And then one, which I'll mention here that I didn't talk about the findings in large part because it is such a new topic, um, is that the used vehicle, what we call the secondary market, as well as repeat EV, new EV buyers, so those who are buying a new electric vehicle after having owned one already, either making it their second vehicle or, uh, as is, we're now seeing is often the case, having sold their first one into the used market, um, this will become an increasingly important group to understand um, as the sales increase. And this seems to be an understudied topic um, in the literature as we've gone forward. Um, so I'm just going to flash these. I'm not going to read through them. That way they're in the presentation, but this is the bibliography uh, for the, the, uh, the, the studies that we looked at. So I've just got three slides here. Um, the first two are from the uh, the first two papers, and then this third slide is from the outreach uh, paper. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through them all, and there, there will be more cited in the uh, in the white papers themselves. I wanted to put some of the key studies here uh, just in case folks want to track down some of the sources that we used in advance of the white papers um, being available. So you've got them there in the recording, and you can hopefully pull from them, and then you're more than welcome to contact me, and I can um, I can get a, a bibliography over if there was something that, uh, that we missed here. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and say thank you for, for your attention. I know we've covered uh, a, a lot of ground, and as I said, a, uh, in a way that, that's often a little bit more, um, more uh, text-heavy than I would usually cover this topic, um, but we did want to make sure to be able to um, share, uh, share some of these, uh, some of these um, findings with you. Um, so thanks so much for the questions that have come in uh, already. We have about 13 minutes here, and I will try to get through as many as I can. Um, so, Leon, should I just read them off of here? Or? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to kind of uh, go in order, and I'll try to combine them if there are ones that are uh, that are similar. Um, so, so David asks uh, about slide three. So thanks for uh, for uh, bearing with us while we went through the rest of the presentation. David uh, asks about the federal $7,500 incentive ending in 2019. So I didn't focus on that. Um, that's a little bit of an oversimplification, um, but it's referencing the fact that uh, the, the way it's set up. Uh, is um, as manufacturers hit 200,000 vehicles, uh, total electric vehicle sales, um, the incentive starts to phase out. Um, we didn't study that in detail here, but we're, the Tesla has already hit that, GM will hit that very soon, Nissan will hit it soon as well. Um, as these, sorry, GM has already hit it and it's starting to decline um, in the near future, and several other auto manufacturers will hit it in the near future. So that is going to change the incentive environment. You're going to see a con more confusing environment where um, People don't necessarily know that they won't be getting it for certain vehicles. Um, the federal incentive is actually a tax credit, so you have to wait and get it on your taxes. So there may be some surprised people. Um, and it's, it, it brought us into an uncertain policy environment. There are many federal discussions going on about the future of that tax credit that I won't get into here. But that was the, the reason that we said that incentive ends in 2019, just to make the point that we're going to start to um, lose some of these, uh, some of these um, other rebate sources. Um, the question, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reading these live, so bear with me for a second while I go through them. Um, uh, so uh, there's a question, for those whose income is too high for CVRP rebate, how does the program capture their EV buyer data? 
uh, this data is important to help plan EVSC locations. So I totally agree. Um, I think I will check with our colleagues uh, who run the rebate program. My understanding is they won't get that data directly from their rebate program, but they also do do surveys um, of overall EV buyers. Uh, and then UC Davis uh, and other researchers do extensive surveys of EV buyers. So pretty much if you buy an EV in the United States, you'll get a letter from UC Davis asking you to complete a survey. So we have um, data from thousands of buyers. And so we know, I think, uh, quite a bit about the buyers of EVs overall. I didn't talk about that research in detail, but I'm happy to follow up um, with uh, our plug-in hybrid and electric vehicle center that leads that research. Um, so there's a question related to, was our federal tax rebates incentive held constant in our assessment? Um, essentially, yes, because these all the research that we did was looking at backwards looking um, looking uh, studies where that incentive was present. Uh, not everybody who buys an EV is able to take advantage of the federal tax credit for various reasons, um, and that wasn't the focus of our research. There are other studies out there that look at the importance of the federal tax credit, and it does seem to be important, um, although I will add less important than it would be if it was a point of sale rebate or a, or, or a, uh, a direct rebate rather than a tax credit. Um, uh, but we, so yes, essentially it's been held constant. I think actually it's a good point. I didn't mention that as a research gap. Um, understanding <laughs> the future vehicle market and how important rebates will likely be, uh, how important state and local rebates may be as the federal credit goes away is really important. We have a few studies I think in the works that will um, that will that will address those questions. Um, okay, sorry, looking down the next question. Um, so, a good question from Ramon Zavala. Uh, so, he asks, uh, did we attempt to find a relationship between home ownership specifically, not just income level, and EV, PH, and EV ownership, regardless if it's bought new? So, I, I do not, I'm just going to state this as a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I, we didn't, I could say we did not hear uh, go seek to answer that um, in, in our review, uh, and I haven't at least personally done a literature review there. So rem I may follow up with you on uh, the, the details of this question, because I think that's a, that's a good question for, um, for future research. Ah, uh, we have a question, are EV incentives also available to ride-hailing companies looking to include EVs in their fleets? And is there a different incentive policy for commercial use of EVs? Um, so the short answer is, is th this policy, yes, in general, can be uh, can go to uh, to those who are, who are looking to include it in their fleets. Um, I would say for the different incentive policy in the works, there's um, a, a different program uh, under a new law called SB 1014 that would seek to uh, come up with a structure to encourage ride-hailing fleets to become uh, more electrified. And then the companies themselves doing ride-hailing, such as Lyft and Uber, um, are considering a variety of sort of company internal policies that would help encourage um, use of EVs. I'm sorry, so I should have said uh, the ride hailing companies, those are all personally owned vehicles, so the buyers of those are, are um, able to take advantage of those credits. I um, mean, you know, none of the, the vehicles um, are not generally here, at least yet, owned by, um, by, by companies. Um, what is the co approximate cost effectiveness of EVs in reducing GHGs in terms of dollars per ton of CO2? Um, so that's a, that's a great and broad reaching question. Uh, we didn't seek to address it here. There are a lot of papers that try to do so. Um, I'll say the, a big challenge with that is um, it, do you look at it, uh, do you look at it um, only in terms of the additional vehicle added because of the policy, in which case they tend to look you know, relative to other policies uh, rather expensive. That is, it costs quite a bit to get an electric, a new electric vehicle out there. But the uh, point of uh, EV rebate policy isn't just to sell vehicles now. The point is to create a market, right? So the stated goal of the policy is also to create a long-term market for those vehicles. So do you attribute some of the emission savings from future electric vehicles to the current rebate program? Um, and, and that very, very significantly changes that cost per ton of CO2 assumption. So depending on the methodology of the program, it can vary, uh, can vary extremely wildly from a fairly low cost to a, a very high cost. And I've seen, I've seen at least two orders of magnitude of estimates out there in the literature. That's not what we collected here. If you would like to follow up on that, that's a, a question I think is, um, is interesting to try to quantify going forward. Um, uh, okay, so the, the presentation states that overnight charging increases emissions, but it is the, uh, the asker's understanding that those baseline fossil fuels plant run overnight, whether there's a customer for that electricity, um, thus it might be created 
uh, whether or not the electricity is used. Um, so this really depends on exactly how you do your, met your methodology. Um, so you certainly wouldn't expect from adding or reduce, subtracting a single electric vehicle to have a, 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 me a measurable effect on plants and how they run. Um, it, that said, the electric system is in complete balance at all times. So any additional load you add does mean a plant somewhere has to work a little bit harder. Um, and that would generally be accomplished by adding a little bit more fuel. So it does mean that adding demand, um, probably not one EV, that wouldn't be noticeable, but if you added you know, 10,000 electric vehicles, you would potentially not, maybe not add a plant that would run, but you would mean that they, you would, they would have to run at a slightly higher um, generation rate to be able to meet that demand. So uh, it, yes, I think there is an anticipation that adding EVs at night would change the marginal generation mix. Um, it's tough to do with one EV. Um, I, I think the, the second part of the point was uh, it seemed more efficient to, to, to use sort of an average rate. Um, and and there, there are, you know, I think for some purposes that's, that's justifiable. Um, it, but if you want to understand the effect on emissions of adding in a large group of electric vehicles to a system, I think you really want to understand the full electric uh, infrastructure and what, what would happen as a result of that. Um, so uh, there's a question, uh, what were studies done that showed emissions impact based on vehicle replaced by EV purchase? Um, and then anecdotally, it appears that many EV buyers are trading cars like the Toyota Prius, which would mean minimal emissions impact. Um, so this is another one where I don't know all of the literature. Um, one of my colleagues who, or two of my colleagues who worked with us on the literature for this, um, Eric Mulliger and David Rapson, our economics program, um, have done work looking at the effect on EV purchase and what that means, or, or efficient vehicle purchase, I should say, and what that means for uh, for the second vehicle and how that might be used. And you do see an inter interesting interaction effects between those. Hey, okay, Austin, so we have Brett Williams from CARB. Oh, great. Would love to just um, weigh in on this, give a little commentary. Yeah, great. Go ahead, Brett. Sorry if I uh, if I mischaracterized your work. No, not at all, Austin. Can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Great. So uh, two points, one to that specific question and then a little bit more broad. We do have program data and there are uh, reports being prepared for the legislature that do speak to uh, emissions reductions in a, in a variety of ways. We've looked at emission reductions across four statewide electric vehicle rebate programs that we administer on behalf of state agencies in California, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. And the vehicles that are being replaced still are a majority uh, older, more polluting vehicles. So older, say five or more model years old and a majority gasoline vehicles. We are starting to see a, a slowly increasing rate of replacement of clean vehicles with clean vehicles over time, but the majority still are at this point. And then it gets into the issue of, okay, well, if you are replacing a clean vehicle with a clean vehicle, then you, you're you putting that clean vehicle into the, the used EV market. And that's the dynamic you mentioned earlier. So hopefully uh, that, that sheds a little bit of light just or, or sort of calibrates expectations about uh, replaced vehicles. Um, the last thing I'll just say, because you did such a, I would say, an excellent and careful job of describing the benefits of, of income caps and increased rebates uh, and some of the uncertainties around outreach, the one perspective, the only perspective that remains uh, to add a little bit of color commentary to would be the, the implementation perspective. And that's certainly not the, necessarily even the most important perspective, but some of the impacts of um, uh, income caps, for example, that might not be in the literature include some of the things you hinted about having to do with program complexity. So outreach complexity and consumer confusion, uh, dealer reluctance or fears about liability and, and sort of the application complexity and intrusiveness required from collecting tax forms from consumers. And, you know, this does add up to a little bit of a burden even on, on those applicants, all applicants, you know, including those that you're trying to uh, favor in terms of cost effectiveness and, and equity metrics. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll point out is just the one thing that the, the income cap in California has done, it has precluded California from adopting a point of sale rebate, which is what is the case in the Northeast states. So uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York all have, uh, Connecticut, New York have point of sale rebates and Massachusetts would have that option. Uh, when you have to verify income ahead, that, that does preclude that option. And so trading off cost effectiveness and equity considerations, for example, if you had an, an MSRP or vehicle priced program that was point of sale, would that be better or worse than an income cap program on those two metrics? I don't know, but that would be a very interesting research question, for example, because um, our Connecticut uh, 
income distributions where they just have a vehicle price cap and no income cap actually look at California, look like California income distributions after the income cap was put in place. Whereas Massachusetts income distributions where they don't have a hard uh, MSRP cap look like California income distributions before the income cap. And so lots of competing policy alternatives and recommendations there. And, and that's about all that I, I would be able to add to your, your very good and careful characterization of, of, of these issues. So thanks for the couple of moments to weigh in. Thanks, Brett. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and and that, that's really valuable context. And I think a great way to close um, that general finding that we're weighing the, you know, a huge variety of considerations. And that makes it very hard to say, like, what would an optimal policy look like? And a few of the questions that I didn't get to are really around sort of how do you design an optimal policy? I think we know now that there's no such thing as a truly global optimum. Um, but the uh, Hopefully, we hope that the research we've done and the work from, from Brett and his team at the Center for Sustainable Energy, as well as others in the research community, um, can help us at least uh, stepwise improve these policies going forward um, and help lead to better electric vehicle deployment um, that, that in maximizes the uh, environmental benefits as well as the other goals, such as um, equity uh, that, that cities and states are trying to accomplish. Um, so, Leon, do you, wanna, do you have any closing remarks? I um, just want to say thank you to everyone for uh, attending the webinar. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, um, but please look out for a follow-up email that will contain a quick survey if you want to share your thoughts and feedback on today's presentation. Um, it will also have links to past webinars as well as this webinar when ready as well as the presentation slides. And I think that's it for me. Great. Well, let me just add my, my thank you to everyone for, for joining us. And again, um, apologies if there was any inconvenience for having to reschedule, um, but really glad uh, that so many folks were able to join us today and uh, ask such good questions. Um, don't be a stranger. This is the stuff I love to do. So I hope you know how to get in touch with anything that we didn't get to today. Um, and uh, please do check out the whole series. Uh, I think it's a great set of interesting topics. And even if you don't think you'll be interested going in, give it a shot because uh, Leon and, and the webinar team, as well as uh, the Institute of Transportation Studies overall, have really put together uh, a great set of topics that I, I hope folks will follow. So thanks a lot.